Remember this proverb, it's very, very simple. And we have this in my country, you have it in your country also. You never know what you've got until it's gone. Yeah. The comedian, actor and writer Felix Dexter died last month. You know, you deal with it, star. He was one of the trailblazers. A comic genius. <laughs> he went on stage and he did it on his terms. Hey, don't please pay attention. <laughs> And the audits are falling about. He never sought celebrity status, but Felix was one of the best respected performers in the business. One love, one love. <laughs> London Underground. <laughs> Mash up Lucifer good, yes. <laughs> the screen comes alive when he's on. He had that Richard Pryor thing that he could say a, a really edgy joke without looking angry. Can we laugh at this? Do you have to be able to enunciate and pronunciate? Absolute tosh! He made comedy slick. So sit back and enjoy this tribute to the one and only Felix Dexter. Yes, At the age of seven, Felix came to Britain with his mother from the island of St. Kitts. Most people who come to this country from the Caribbean, their families are going to go to um, Brixton, St. Paul's, Handsworth, Moss Side, what have you, and so on. Felix ended up in Surrey. I went to school, I was covered in those prefect badges, you know, from head to toe. I looked like an armadillo, you know? <laughs> Although Felix told his friends very little about his background, it's clear his childhood was far from typical. Lots of black British people have the experience of being, you know, the only black person at school or whatever, but normally they would have that experience in a working class context. Felix was having that in a very middle class context. So that's going to make you a bit different. Being in the geography lesson, every time there was an issue about a tropical region, it was always, oh, uh, Felix, you should know this. <laughs> you come from a hot country. Oh, yes, mate. It's very hot in Guildford, isn't it? <laughs> Felix went to law school in London and was training to become a barrister when he decided to give it all up and try his hand at stand-up comedy. Felix's mum, um, a mild coronary would, would probably be an understatement. Are you going to do what? Comedy. Once he's set his mind to do something, he's going to go ahead and do it. Felix began performing in the 80s at the height of the alternative comedy scene. He had a 10-minute open spot, and he absolutely stormed it. He went straight from a 10 minutes into a full 20. He was that good. You're right on. You're my type of people because I can I can feel it. I can feel it. You're anti-racist. You're anti-sexist. You're right on. <laughs> you're vegetarian. You're the sort of people who would probably say, "Oh no 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 no! Don't say the word black. Don't say black person. Say high melanin content person." <laughs> bar bar high melanin content sheep. Have you any wool? Mainstay down at comedy store and, uh, and jonglers and the, and the bigger clubs that we all did all the time. You had to get Felix in. Felix was the headline act. He had a whole routine about wanting to have sex but being turned down by a sleepy partner and then trying to surreptitiously masturbate in the bed and being banished to the spare room. Don't do that in here! His welcome to Scotland look always worked. And it was funny. When I got off the train in Dundee, I got the welcome to Scotland look. It goes like this. <laughs> as good as he was as a stand-up, I could see in the early days little voices were coming in. George Anselm, come look, the next door people are going crazy in the street. Me, I always thought it was funny. Come watch them look. Ah! And you think he really loves doing that. He's, you can see he's found a whole, a whole new uh, area to move into. By the early 90s, Felix was a fixture on the alternative comedy scene, but he was one of the only black faces. You know, the clubs were all white people, the acts were all white people. There just weren't any black people in the audience. So when a new black comedy circuit began to emerge, centered around the Hackney Empire, 
Felix's comedy found its home. She's sitting there with the man, she's not saying anything at all. Because she knows the man has not given her authority to speak. When we started the black comedy circuit, there was always this rumor that there was this other black guy on the circuit and it wasn't Lenny Henry. And so we were like, who is this guy that we're hearing about? The first time I saw Felix was at the Hackney Empire. And I walked out thinking, I like this man, I'm gonna remember him forever. As the black comedy scene grew in popularity, television executives began to sit up and take notice. In 1991, a groundbreaking new comedy sketch show was launched. It's all been quite a shock. Quite. Now, if you could just tell me in your own words how it happened. It was a damp and moonless night. <laughs> My heart fluttered like, like a caged bird as I walked through a deserted churchyard. The Real McCoy was the first black sketch show written by African-Caribbean people and performed by them. <laughs> Ladies, please don't take the weave seriously. <laughs> Everybody said, OK, this is the turning point for black comedy. You could be in a club, right, and sketch this side and the other side move. <laughs> the audience felt that they had found a show that told their story and told their story funny. You know, it wasn't depressing. It wasn't about no issues or difficult. It was just funny. Felix came on board in series three, which, in my opinion, is when it really got its legs. Everything he did was sort of magic. I mean, he had the characters that he evolved. You didn't really have to find anybody to work with him. He kind of came in with the characters. The Real McCoy was where Felix's character comedy really took flight. The first one that I remember him introducing was the barrister lawyer. Hey, hey. Um, I'm Douglas, and this is my club. Uh, when I heard about your programme, I thought, absolutely marvellous idea, it really was. And he just started to speak, and the crowd went crazy. Uh, racism in Britain today, wonderful, wonderful, absolutely lovely. <laughs> um, but it is, yes, of course, it's a really big problem, enormous problem, big, enormous, tremendously big problem, yeah. I think we had to do about two or three takes so it didn't sound like canned laughter. I lapsed into the vernacular, you know, blouse and skirts, box bottom. <laughs> Beat down Babylon. <laughs> Get on, my brethren, and so on and so forth. Uh, Ross cloth, I am out. There are nuances and little phrases that you can pull out that have reduced the room to fits, which would leave a white audience thinking, why, why is that funny, you know? And I think it gave him a freedom to be somebody that maybe he wasn't able to really be in, a, in the clubs that we played. Our mission is only one thing, and what it is? It is to mash up Lucifer! <laughs> mash up Lucifer! <laughs> mash him up! Yes! Not just a little bit. We have to mash him up good, make him go down on the ground, start bawling and crying! When he done mash up Lucifer, I just thought to myself, hilarious. And some of the young ladies as well, I've got something to say to you. <laughs> I noticed some of you, you're walking about. Your skirt is all, 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 you know. <laughs> Cover up yourself. <laughs> I mean to say, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and then he starts wiping his brow, and I'm thinking, the church people are going to be so upset with you. You've gone too far. You've gone too far. He does take you to the point where you think, is he? Yes. Oh! And then you could just go, oh, uh, uh. And that's what makes a brilliant comedian. It challenges you. He makes you laugh even though you don't think you should be laughing. That's a great comedian. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'd just like to say something. <laughs> no. My name is Nathaniel. I'm from Lagos, and I'm studying accountancy. Felix was never afraid to be subversive, particularly with Nathaniel, the Nigerian accountant come cab driver. And what I'd like to do is to teach some of you West Indians, <laughs> especially the Jamaicans, how <laughs> oh, oh, to speak the Queen's mother's language. How <laughs> oh, to speak the Queen's mother's language. He was a Caribbean man playing an African, ridiculing West Indians. 
Um, so, you know, this character was a, a, a one-off. What I've noticed, you're mucking about with your H's all the time. What you are doing, <laughs> if there is an H, if there is an H in front of the vowel, you are taking it away. <laughs> and if there's not supposed to be one there, you are putting one in. <laughs> so what you are doing, in your own accent, you are saying things like, my friend Hachibal was in the hospital. <laughs> They're keeping him in Hover now. <laughs> for a observation. Because he's having a operation <laughs> on his hernia. It wasn't done with spite or, or even real ridicule. It was done with, um, with a sense of, I suppose, love. But as the nation embraced his many characters, those closest to him knew very little of the private man. It was always good to see him, have a bit of a chat, do your act, and then he'd go. I produced two national tours for him. I slept in his spare room, and I gigged with him for 20 years, and I still hardly knew him. He would come and do the show and leave. And sometimes you might say to him, so, Felix, I don't see you anybody, you, you know? And he'll go, <laughs> hey. And you think, you're not going to tell me, are you? Uh, he was just uh, a kind of an island. You create characters to hide away, you know. I remember talking to a therapist years ago when I first started, saying, oh, characters are dodgy, you know. They're... And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you, you want to hide in different characters. And I think he was a very classic example of that. It's fluid, it's fluid, all right? Nice, 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 nice. You see stupid right on my forehead? You see stupid right on my forehead? If you see stupid right on my forehead, you better rub it off, because I don't want to be sat here with stupid right on my forehead. By the mid-90s, Felix and his comic creations were hot property. He was playing cameo roles on all the big comedy shows. You must call yourself Mr. Fry and Mr. Lorry, and then when you are more famous, you can drop the, drop the Mr. Ronnie Biggs, it's not yes or no, is it? Well, yes, it is. Good. <laughs> Say what you like about Paul Simon and Malcolm McLaren, they gave African music structure. Before, of course, they yes. met these producers. I mean, there was all this drumming the whole time. Drumming, you know? drumming, 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 drumming. That's the one. <laughs> then, when he was offered a part in The Fast Show, Felix met his comedy kindred spirits. <laughs> we needed someone who could do a very convincing um, urban slang. Last time, though, I was in a dance clash. Right. Song clash. Right. By no. God, ninja man. Yeah. Every yeah. Song, yeah. Every, Paul and I, not being um, from the streets, shall we say, uh, we didn't presume to write this script ourselves. So we needed to find someone who could who could write and could improvise. So me turn wrong, but when me turn back. I the bread in the pan and chin up in my deal with it, star, yard star. <laughs> Me just look back and look, all right then, Rockstone, <laughs> Rockstone. <laughs> no, no, we can't keep up with us. <laughs> I don't know what the bloody hell you're on about. <laughs> We actually d developed a sort of professional relationship from then on because he asked uh, me and Charlie to script edit a pilot that he'd done of his own show. The pilot took the characters from Felix's live act and placed them in a sketch show. Don't tell me I'm backside right. I'm not we thought this was going to be a chance, and so did Felix, you know, for him to showcase his characters uh, on his own. What is going on? Stop, stop, stop! I cannot believe what you... I mean, you, 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 you're putting... You're putting the devil into this young girl! Yeah, he has. You know, I'm sorry, I've got no choice. I've got to suck the devil out of her! <laughs> the show went out in September 1995, but it wasn't picked up as a series. I personally believe there was disappointment in, in that not working out for whatever reason. On the back of doing his sketch show, he did try and develop the lawyer character. <laughs> respect, respect, respect. A year later, Felix was given a second pilot. Please take a seat, Mr Johnson. 
It was a sitcom featuring Douglas, a well-to-do lawyer all at sea in multicultural Britain. <laughs> Douglas is kind of him, I think. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> he was lampooning himself as much as anything else. He was lampooning the black guy who doesn't actually eat curry goat and rice every Saturday. You know, why should he? Oh, um, hello, brother. Brother? What the hell are you talking about? Since when is me and his family? I'm most dreadfully sorry. It's just that uh, as we are of the same hue, I thought that there might be some uh, cultural solidarity at least. Same hue? C cultural what? Show me your damn ticket. Like the sketch show, Douglas wasn't commissioned as a series. I saw him at the BBC once and we was talking about him and he, and he was so gracious, it was almost like he didn't, he missed his bus, he didn't get the bus. It was always like, okay, n never mind, let's just keep moving. And I remember saying, Felix, if you don't get it, then we might as well give up. Because if there's anyone of the black comedy circuit that should have got their own show, Felix. People have always recognised Felix, but whether they quite realised um, what he was capable of, you know, some of the executives perhaps didn't realise that. He was one of those performers who far too many people missed through short-sightedness, through the status quo. There's a million and one reasons why not enough people saw Felix Dexter, and none of them was his. When I was in school or in the barber shop, um, the constant conversation piece would be, why hasn't Felix got his own show? When Jason worked with Felix a decade later, he got the chance to ask him about it. He could have played the race card in his answer to me, but he didn't. And that made me respect him even more. And that's where I, one of the major things that I got from him in terms of perseverance. You know, um, no matter what obstacles are put in front of you, keep going, keep going. Was there any suggestion that she... The next few years were busy ones for Felix. Bit of a saint. As well as touring his live show, he took on a variety of acting roles for television. Jasmine! You're a homosexual fellow. <laughs> How many ages hence will this our lofty scene be acted over? Every man! Away! People are often surprised when a, it turns out a comedian can act, but it's all in there. Different voices that emerge through the stand-up. Um, you know, that's, that, is, is, that is acting, that's what it is. Felix also began to work in theatre. He performed with the Royal Shakespeare Company and at the Young Vic. In 2004, he appeared in a production of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, along with a dozen other comedians. You can imagine with a company mainly made up of comedians, um, there's always the danger that it turns into a bit of a kind of um, stand-up showdown. I mean, I took my cue off him, because he's the man who's been there, he's done it, and I'm going, oh, I can't play the fool if he's being, you know, very, very serious. And I just remember that, that Felix just always be this very relaxed, very calm, very wise kind of voice at the heart of it, it always taking the work seriously. And I knew him as an actor and not as a comedian. In 2006, Felix rejoined his old friends Paul Whitehouse and Charlie Higson on a radio show called Down the Line. Quite a simple idea, really, which is just a spoof radio show where all the characters that call in can vent their spleen. I'm going to help the environment, yeah? Yeah. Can be politically incorrect. I had a very bad problem, mm -hmm. and it was never diagnosed. Right, what, like dyslexia or something like that? No, I was blind. But they're all played by performers that we like. Felix Dexter. Felix what? Dexter, obviously, is very good at doing the black hands. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you cannot progress in your education unless you have the clarity of speech. Right. No. One of the most important things you have to be able to do is you have to... We live in a, a multicultural society, so as well as uh, acknowledging it, we should also be able to laugh about it. And Felix has al had already opened the door. Listen, mate, listen, listen. I've got a lot of black mates, all right? I, I, I can't couldn't care if you've got friends in Jamaica, in Brixton, and the black and white mainstream. You are parking the wrong place. Move the car, remove it from here. 
Over the course of this series, I've travelled the length and breadth of Britain, and I've met some diverse and fascinating characters. <laughs> Down the Line was reincarnated for television as Bellamy's People, a spoof celebrity travelogue fronted by an earnest young journalist, Gary Bellamy. Gary Bellamy. Are you that? I'm that. <laughs> <laughs> Check one this out. Check over here. Look oh, at like your pumas. Eh? No, 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 that's the panther. No, 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 that's that's lion, lion. Yeah, that's a pan, that's a panther. I no, think. man, that's a black lion. We are talking about it. Eh? You don't, you can't get black lions. Well, you you argue with me about whether it's a panther or lion. That's a lion. Yeah. It's an unmade. The show was entirely unscripted and played to all of Felix's strengths. Really? A square inch. Yes, you're right. Check <laughs> It's all completely spontaneous and improvised. <laughs> That's an amazing skill. And to make these characters so different and to give them all their own personalities, but also their own language. On one side is Scylla, on the other side is Charybdis, the whirlpool and the monster. Only Argonaut reached true. He knew these characters so well, he got inside them so well, and he, and he knew how their minds were. He could go on all day in one character, and that was sometimes a problem. We had to stop him. <laughs> so Felix, we've only got a half an hour show. It's a good pleasure to meet you. I'm the, I'm the gentleman that you are going to. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Hello. Yes, this is my blood. So, in my opinion, Mark. No, no, we have to one second. One of the stars of the show was Felix's character, Julius Olufemwe. Eternal student and rampant anglophile. Hold on a moment, please. We won't be able to hear you if you don't put that on. Calm down. Calm down. Stop it. Stop it. So, Julius, why have you brought me here? Well, you know, I've brought you here to show you, in a sense, what are the most important features of London, if we mm. carry on talking about the thing that we must celebrate about England. Yes. Right? The thing about Julius is he is more patriotic and more British than any of the other characters in the show, and he's always picking up Gary Bellamy, the host, for not being British enough. Nelson's column, what a marvellous representation mm. of all the best of English history that that's can not, be. That's not Nelson's column. Huh? No, 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 that's Nelson's Column. No, no, Nelson's Column is in Trafalgar Square. Please, We're in Palmer. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter. It's virtually the same as him. They both we were talking about what it meant to be British, and he was saying that we'd kind of, I think we'd lost that. And I said, well, what about the Jubilee? That was a very British, uh, you know, great thing. And then it somehow got round to Brian May played on the roof of Buckingham Palace. Brian May was on top of the palace playing God Save the Queen. What uh, could be more British than that? And uh, how long was he doing that? For about two and a half minutes. There you go. Winston Churchill would be disgusted with you. Brian May should be paying for an hour. Three hour. But Five hour. I'm laughing. Ten he does hour. not crack. He is that person. And he just keep going with it. Uh, you know, for an hour, two hour, you know. What do you mean by people like us? People of, of, of breeding, yes, people who uh, are bore the vulgar and the crass, you know? But to be fair, I mean, surely aren't you a bit of a fish out of water living in the countryside yourself? Oh, no, I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean. Mm. If I come to you, BBC, say, give me TV show, you give me TV show? No? No? Mr. Khan, the self-styled Muslim community leader in Bellamy's People, eventually became the subject of his own sitcom. And when its creator, Adil Ray, was casting for the series, Felix was top of the list. Uh, this is Omar, he's new. Excellent. I always felt that a black Muslim coming up against Mr. Khan would be very funny. And he was the only person we didn't audition for. Everyone else we auditioned for, Felix was the one guy, just called him up, got this thing, do you want to do it? Yes. I don't think he's even got an agent. He was like, yeah, I'll do it. Ah, salam alaikum. I'm delighted to make the acquaintance of such a prominent member of the local community. <laughs> What's wrong with him? He's from Somalia. Oh. <laughs> You're always certain that Felix will find the funny here. He'll do something funny. And it's sometimes very simple lines for Felix. It was, you know, Assalamu alaikum, which is the Muslim greeting. But the way Felix would say it would just crack us up. What are you doing here? You're not even on the bloody committee. I'm taking the minutes of the meeting on the computer. He's our technical wizard. Him? Uh, that's what I used to do back in Somalia. You worked in IT? No, he was a wizard. <laughs> the way Felix played it was very clever because sometimes there was moments where you weren't sure whether Omar was deliberately winding Mr. Khan up or he's just, just that was just Omar. <laughs> During filming, it became clear that Felix was having some health problems. Felix did tell us he was ill, but he would tell us it was a back problem. 
And looking back now, and you kind of go, okay, it, you know, now we know what the problem might have been. When we were making the last series of Down the Line in the spring of 2013, we noticed that he was slightly under par. That there wasn't the energy in the performances, and he didn't seem as mentally fast. And we we got him to do a couple of things again, and he kept apologising, saying, "Oh, sorry, I've got a bit of a cold at the moment. I'm not feeling too good." To a handful of close friends, Felix revealed the truth. When he called me, I honestly thought he was ringing to wind me up about um, uh, Arsenal being top of the league. I saw his name come from my phone, Felix. Ooh! I said, oh, hi, Felix. I know you've not been well because I've heard about your back. So what's going on, blah, blah. And that's when he said, um, well, you know, Judith, um, you know, well, Basically, I'm dying. There was no wind-up, there was no punchline, and he said, oh, I've got this multiple myeloma, and, um, and he'd had it for a long time. By the time his friends learned about it, Felix's cancer had reached its final stages. I went to see him a few times, and I did sort of broach the subject of the fact that he, he was a guarded person, and... Uh, all got, uh, <laughs> um, got very emotional. Eddie and I went up to the hospice that he was in, and as soon as we walked in, he went, I should have told you, I'm so sorry. I should have told you, I'm so sorry. And we were like, no, <laughs> come on, man. We laughed hard until I thought the people at the hospice were going to say, look, they're dying people, you're going to have to keep it down. So for the first week, chatty, great. Second week, a little bit less energy, and by the third week, the third week was the last week. And he reached out, and him reaching out to me was... was just really, really, really touching. On October the 18th this year, Felix died. Although he was never a household name, to his friends and fans, he was simply a legend. He will go down in our history as one of our comic genius, not a black comic genius, a comic genius. He knew his craft to the bone. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Can I, can I please interrupt you? Can I please interrupt you? <laughs> Wait, you West Indians, what are you doing? I can't believe it. He invited, uh, he invited everyone to laugh, you know, black, white, whatever wherever you were from. You know, I, I think his legacy is he was one of our finest character comedians. I was raving last night, you know. And, uh, well, you see, a whole heap of my spars come out there. <laughs> and, uh, well, we, uh, we mash up the place. For me, he was good enough to be the star of the show, but, you know, he was still happy enough to play his position and he wouldn't let that kind of um, get in the way of being professional and doing a good job because, you know, his work speaks for itself. Baby love. Yeah. You're, you're feeling that? Nice. You've got a construction here like that, right? Yeah. And then start with a ting. It's just a shame that... Um, that he, he, he didn't get a chance to see this and to see what people thought about how people sort of love him and how they'll miss him. You've been lovely to me. I hope you've enjoyed me. Thanks a lot for listening. Good night to you.